Good day, and thank you for joining our webinar on the fundamentals of social inclusion. I'm your moderator for this session, Joe Chen. This is the first of a series on the different facets of social inclusion, which will include measuring social, social inclusion in early January, as well as policies and programs in February. In today's session, our expert, Maitreyi Das, will explain the basic concepts of social exclusion, which exists in all countries and has important implications for development. She will explain social inclusion, what it is, who gets ex excluded, and why. Uh, Maitreyi will present for about 20 minutes. Once she completes her presentation, we will have three poll questions that we encourage you to all participate in. She will then comment on those uh, questions and answers. And then we will open up for uh, question and answers, where she will answer your questions that you have. Um, and I'm absolutely honored to introduce Maitreyi. Um, Maitreyi is the lead social development specialist in the social, urban, rural, and resilience global practice of the World Bank in Washington, D.C. Uh, she works on issues of inequality and exclusion and on the design and implementation of social policies and programs. Maitreyi started her career as a lecturer in St. Stephen's College, University of Delhi, and has been a MacArthur Fellow at the Harvard Center of Population Development Studies and worked as an advisor to the United Nations Development Program. She has a PhD in sociology and demography from the University of Maryland. Her recent research includes lead authorship of Inclusion Matters, the Fund Foundation for Shared Prosperity, Poverty and Social Exclusion in India, and Whispered Voices, Gender and Social Transformation in Bangladesh, as well as several articles and working papers. Uh, and without further ado, uh, give the floor to Maitri. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, and it's a real privilege to be here today to, to be able to speak to, to you all who are um, logged on. So thank you very much. Um, I'm hoping I can hear you all. Yes? Very good. So um, the book that, uh, that I'm going to actually be speaking from is, is this one. Um, and you see this beautiful uh, photograph. Well, it's a painting right behind you. And uh, it's done by a very famous Ugandan artist, um, Jeffrey Mukasa. So... Um, it's a tribute to Jeffrey Mukasa as well. Um, I will be speaking about um, um, our journey through this book and the kinds of uh, insights that we have got while while um, doing this book. And this is the, the product of a team of, of people. Um, the reason why we did this book actually was that social inclusion is suddenly very high on the agenda of uh, development banks, of governments, of civil society. Um, as we move towards the post-MDG agenda, this becomes even more relevant because uh, the post-MDG agenda is likely to be very much about inequality, exclusion, and other forms of, of social um, issues. So it, it, has been, um, it has been a very interesting journey for us, and I'd like to share some of those insights for you. Um, so one of, the, one of the big challenges before us was that we had to define social inclusion. And um, it's um, notoriously many things to many people. So uh, people tend to think, think of it as poverty. Others think, tend to think about it as inequality. Essentially, there's nothing to really wrap your arms about, around in terms of what we mean by social inclusion. So one of the biggest challenges before us was exactly to come up with a simple, easy to digest, but not too simple definition. So um, the way we define social inclusion is that it's a process of improving the terms for individuals and groups to take part in society. And if that sounds deceptively simple, um, we should try and break it down into its constituent parts, which I'm going to do in the course of this presentation. But then we were pushed a little bit further and said, okay, so how do you um, get to social inclusion? Um, and, and there's a more expanded definition of social inclusion, which is the process of improving the ability, opportunity, and dignity of people who are disadvantaged on the basis of their identity to take part in society. And so that, that gives us a little bit about the framing of social inclusion, how we move forward on it. Um, what is also interesting about this idea of social inclusion is that it's very specific to time, to place, and to identities. So the same issue, say for instance migration, may not be a big issue 20 years ago in certain countries. So let's take the, let's take the case of Sweden. Um, it was not a big issue uh, 20 years ago, but today it is. Um, similarly, there could be issues around race, and so Brazil is a is a classic example where in the 1970s, race was not even considered to be a major axis of exclusion. But now, a few years ago, Brazil put in place quotas for people who were of African descent. 
And so um, there, there is a move in the discourse around social inclusion, which makes it very context specific, which makes it very specific to time, to place and to identities. And in this case, the identities I talked about were migration or race, but there could be many others, as I'm going to show in the next slide. Um, it is also very multidimensional, so you could be ex excluded or included along a range of domains, which again, I'm going to speak about a little bit more. Um, it, when, we, when we did the, um, the description of this webinar, um, I said that we would be talking a little bit about the links to, of social inclusion to poverty and inequality, uh, and this has become a very important distinction to make, and yet it's not an easy distinction to make. So we find a lot of people talking about social inclusion as being interchangeable with poverty reduction or with enhancing equality. But the fact that they don't say poverty and they don't say inequality, but they say social inclusion actually means that they mean something different from it. So social inclusion could be about poverty, but it needn't necessarily about, be about poverty. And here I'd like to um, give you the example of, say, a hypothetical rich gay man who lives in Africa. Now, he's not affected by poverty, he's not affected by income inequality, but he is affected by social exclusion almost at the risk of death. Similarly, there are many, many countries in the world where, in fact, people who feel excluded are not the poor, or they may be the poor plus others. It's likely that the middle class feel excluded in many countries, which are actually quite rich, and the countries are rich and the, and the middle class are not poor exactly. So there are ways in which it is linked to poverty, it is linked to inequality, but it's actually more than that. The way we try and explain social inclusion is that it often explains, it often explains poverty, it often explains the reasons for poverty. So why are certain groups overrepresented among the poor? Why are certain people poor despite there being years and years of efforts to actually bring them into the fold and to, to, to help them to rise above poverty? So um, the next slide here, we talk about identity. And um, in, in our definition, you would have noticed that we talked about people who are disadvantaged on the basis of their identity. And so what is identity? Um, identity could arise from in a range of, of social attributes. Uh, it could be ethnicity, for instance, the Roma in, in many countries of Eastern Europe. Uh, it could be what are called indigenous peoples. Uh, in many countries, Indigenous peoples are called tribal groups. They're called ethnic minorities. They may be minor, they may be minorities, but they could equally be majorities and still be excluded. Um, India and Nepal and other countries in South Asia actually has have a very peculiar form of um, social stratification that is called, called caste. And so, people that belong to lower castes tend to be historically have been excluded. Similarly, race people of African dis descent are almost. Um, excluded in many, many parts of the world. Uh, religion, we talk about, say, for instance, Muslims in the post 9-11 era, and there is definitely a sense of exclusion of Muslims, of not all Muslims, but of, of many Muslims in many parts of the world. Similarly, gender, age, um, so there are people who have, um, you know, older people, there may be widows, there may be people that, um, very young people that may be excluded on the basis of their age. Um, it could be undocumented persons, it could be migrants, people with disabilities, people with different sexual orientations, and people that come from a different socioeconomic background than the majority. And yet, nobody is just a woman, nobody is just an older person, nobody is just an ethnic minority. They, are, they may be a woman who's from an ethnic, ethnic minority, um, who also is, lives in a very, far, a very um, a far away place from the nation's capital. So it's this intersection of identities, it's the overlay of identities that tends to confer, that tends to confer the biggest kinds of disadvantages. And then we say, okay, inclusion in what? What are we talking about when we say social inclusion? And in the framework of this book, which you can actually freely download from, um, from the web, um, it, we talk about inclusion in three, three domains. We talk about markets and people who are economists are actually very familiar with this idea of markets. So when we say markets, we say land, uh, housing, labor markets, finance, credit markets. So there are ways in which you can, we can include or people can be included um, if, they, if they are included in markets to enhance their assets. 
um, they could be included in services. So the classic services would be health, education, but there's also services like social protection, there are services like electricity, like water, um, like transport. So there's a whole range of both infrastructure services and human development services that people can be included in. And finally, we bring in this idea of spaces. Um, the, the idea of spaces is both sort of in physical terms, but it's also what we consider metaphysical terms almost. Um, so we're thinking about spaces as, as political spaces, as cultural spaces. So take the case of indigenous peoples, they are actually, their, their cultural spaces need to be given the due respect in, for them to feel included. So we have this idea of market services and spaces for, as domains of inclusion. Um, then we ask inclusion how? How do we actually get at social inclusion? And we bring up this idea of ability, opportunity, and dignity. Um, neither ability nor opportunity are very unique, um, unique ideas. Uh, I think that the way we think about ability may be a little different from the way the dominant discourse ten tends to think about ability. So um, ability is, is normally considered to be human capital um, attributes of people. But let's take the case of two five-year-old children, okay? two children, the age of five, who are administered standardized tests. One child lives in a, a fairly affluent area with affluent parents um, and lives in the nation's capital. Another child belongs to an ethnic minority and lives very far away, but they are administered the same tests. They may have exactly the same IQ. But in fact, it's likely that the child who has better parental attention, a child who has had a lot of, has had nutrition, a child who has had a lot of favorable circumstances when they were very small, actually will end up doing better than the child who lives very far away. So this idea of ability as being innate to persons, and so people will perform just on the basis of ability, actually may be a flawed notion. And we really bring in the idea of the way social background actually affects the exercise of eff effective ability. Um, then there's the idea of opportunity. And um, we hear a lot of people saying, well, just give uh, equal opportunity and people will be fine. There are two issues here. Getting to equal opportunity in many of the countries that we work in is actually a huge challenge. So how do you actually get at giving perfect secondary school education to two children or to two young people, one living in the nation's capital and one living very far away and belonging to, again, an ethnic minority or a, person, a child with a disability? How would you actually go about this, the supply of opportunity? And even let's suppose you actually give perfect school education, secondary school education to both these children. Um, what's the chance that a child from a lower caste will actually be physically prevented from actually accessing those opportunities? So the idea of opportunity also needs to be thought about very specifically in terms of the way in which social norms, stigmas, prejudices play out in society that actually prevent the exercise of full opportunity, even if it was to be available. Um, finally, we, we come to the idea of dignity. And the idea of dignity is considered to be quite fuzzy. But in fact, what we say is that there's a whole literature around dignity. Um, there are ways in which you can actually measure feelings of dignity. And um, the point that we make is, suppose you have full ability, you have full opportunity, but if you're treated with disrespect and indignity, it's very likely that you will actually reject those terms. You will actually reject the opportunity, reject the ability, and decide that you wanted to not be included. Um, there was a question earlier on self-exclusion. What about people who self-exclude? Why would they self-exclude? It's likely that they would self-exclude because, in fact, that they are treated with the indignity and disrespect. So then we go on to why now? So wh why is this such an important issue right now? Um, and what we say is that perhaps the kinds of transitions that the world is seeing, many of the countries, but global transitions that, that we're seeing, um, are actually transitions that are much more intense and much more important now than they were perhaps 40 years ago. So when um, the, the, the parents of the children whom we're talking about right now were growing up, those transitions were probably not as intense. And what are the kinds of transitions we're talking about? And what are the kinds of demands of, on social inclusion that those transitions are actually making? So 
we're talking about four kinds of transitions, a demographic transition, spatial transitions, economic, and finally, knowledge transitions. Let's take the idea of demographic transitions. So many of the countries that we actually talk about in the book have, have completed a fertility transition. They're also very far ahead on a mortality transition. So what you're seeing now is that there are quite inflated cohorts of young people, which means that there are large numbers of young people in many of the countries that we work in. But in parallel, because life expectancy has gone up, there are also very large proportions of the elderly that, are, um, that, that need care. Um, another transition that we are talking about is a demographic transition where, which people do not consider uh, as being very important, but it is, and that is migration. So you're finding people moving across borders much more than you had 20 or 30 years ago. And this is leading to demands for, for, uh, my, for people who are migrants to have, um, uh, to have voice, to have participation, to have um, the same kinds of, of opportunities as people that they are um, in, whose, in, the, in their host countries. Um, what's happening also because of migration and because of this fertility mortality transition that I was talking about is that there's a huge number of non-traditional families. So the earlier idea of, a, say, a joint family where two generations live together, married parents, having children, living with older parents, actually is no longer the norm. Um, and that, let's take the idea of, of let's take the, the case of China, for instance. Migration is so important in, in China, and, and there are actually families that are left behind in rural areas. So you may actually find people, entire villages, which have elderly people and small children with a completely missing middle. So these families are non-traditional families that we hadn't actually anticipated 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, let's take the idea, uh, let's take the, the case of uh, the Caribbean. Um, there is a retreat from marriage. And so you're finding families that look very different from the way families looked in, even in Latin America, maybe in the Caribbean, the trend was already in, um, in evidence even 30 years ago. But in other parts of Latin America as well, there's a, there's a certain retreat from, from marriage. Um, there's a retreat from childbearing in countries like Japan, but also in, other, in, in countries of Europe. Um, spatial transition. So, so how do we think about spatial transitions? Um, we think about spatial transitions as a very deep urbanization, so expansive urbanization. Um, Latin America is al almost entirely, it's almost 85% urban, but the fastest urbanization is likely to be in Africa. Uh, but Asia is also urbanizing very fast. What this means is that the earlier policies which were very focused on, on, on agrarian issues, on agriculture, are now policies that really need to change um, because much of this urbanization is actually unplanned. And what it's leading to are groups of people that are likely to be very excluded, um, slum residents, indigenous persons who actually migrate to, um, to, um, areas of, um, to urban areas, left behind families that I just talked about, Persons who are internally displaced because of war, it's a form of migration, but it's a forced kind of displacement. It's, it's a displacement of people that are very, very excluded, um, refugees. Uh, so there is a demand for infrastructure, for services, for legal standing, for dignity, for respect, for claim on public spaces, and for safety. Because as urbanization expands, there is actually we're seeing um, in many of our countries that safety, especially for women and girls, is actually becoming a big issue in, for their mobility. Finally, um, we talk about transitions that are uh, knowledge-based transitions. So there are two issues here. There's ICT, but also there's been a huge expansion of education. Um, most of many of our countries actually have very few people who have never been to school. Um, the quality of education is another issue, but in fact, there has been a huge expansion of education. There has also been a huge expansion of ICT. So you're finding that especially younger generations are much more engaged in social media. They are much more connected to young people across the globe. What this means is that they're able to articulate their demands much more effectively. They're able to bond together um, social network, social capital, 
is now coming together in mm. ways that it never have had the opportunity to come together before. Um, there's also a demand for new skills. So the kind of education that that these people um, have may mm. not be in keeping with the demands of their their jobs. Uh, there may be a, a, a huge amount of focus or or needs on non-cognitive skills of skills of how to negotiate their environment, demands for greater accountability. So as people bind together through social media and through other channels, um, they actually demand much greater accountability from their leaders, and they are able to articulate this demand, uh, demand for fair and functioning justice systems. So these are the kinds of issues that we actually raise in Inclusion Matters. Um, Finally, we talk about economic transitions, and people would be most familiar with these, but there has been a very dramatic decline in poverty. There has been an increase in the middle class, um, and yet there are very large numbers of people who are still very poor, very large numbers of, of people who are food insecure, for instance, um, very large numbers of people who are affected by disasters and crises. Um, and so on the one hand, you're seeing a huge decline in poverty, you're seeing the growth of the most wealthy and you're seeing uh, people who are still extremely poor and people who are st still extremely affected by crises and by hunger. So there is then this demand a, for greater, for greater uh, equality enhancing programs. Um, there are new aspirations of people who are coming out of poverty. Uh, but then there are simultaneously also demands for greater social security and safety nets better public services. So this is just to give you an idea of some of the transitions that we are witnessing, um, which are transitions that are extremely, extremely rapid and deep. Um, this is something that um, I have five minutes, all right. Uh, so um, we're, we're talking about how do we understand social inclusion. Uh, you may find the slide a bit busy, but we take the example of uh, uh, a woman, for instance, uh, a tribal woman in India who does not give birth in health centers. And we find that maternal deaths among tribal women, Adivasi women in India, are extremely high. Um, but when the National Family Health Survey went out to question people who had not given birth in health centers for their last child, um, they were asked to give a series of answers. So they could give a multiple choice answers. And um, the answers that we see are not the answers that we would expect. So the answers are not, oh, there was no doctor or there was no, um, uh, you know, it was too far. There was no transport. It was very expensive. All of these are true. But in fact, 72 percent of the responses were that they did not think it necessary. Um, the minute health providers hear this, they say, see, we told you the, the, this is about ignorance. These people actually don't think it necessary. And the cultural chasm between the health providers and the Adivasis really comes to the fore um, when we do a lot more qualitative work and we do focus group discussions with women who have not given birth to health centers. Let's take the idea. Let's take let's take the example of Korku women who live in certain parts of Maharashtra. Um, and the chances are they're going to tell you that they actually don't want to go to a health center where they're going to be treated with indignity and they're not, they're not, their cultural practices are not um, respected. So the question then is, so what do we do? So how do we take social inclusion forward? And many of the questions that we got were exactly about this. So what do we do? Um, I'm going to hold that thought a bit uh, because we are going to have our third webinar exactly on what do we do. Uh, but just to, to say that we've talked a lot about dignity and respect, um, we can actually do something in terms of policy to enhance the accountability of providers to treat people with dignity and respect just as we make them accountable to come to office on time and to follow certain technical protocols. We can think about um, the ways in which they treat their clients um, as um, in terms of dignity and respect as well. So I'm going to stop there, and I look forward to the questions. Thank you very much, Maitri, for that very thought-provoking and energetic presentation. Um, so now we will move to three poll questions. Um, so you should see it on your screen, like we do here. So the question is, social inclusion is about improving the ability, opportunity, and dignity 
which do you think is the most important for social inclusion? A, ability, B, opportunity, C, dignity, and the last selection is no vote. So please make your votes now and Maitri will comment on uh, every facet of the question and answer. Interesting. So um, we're finding that um, the poll that asked whether you think ability, opportunity, and dignity, which is the most important, um, ability, only 3.7% of you think that ability is important. Over 51%, so almost 52% of you think opportunity is, imp is very important. And 44% think dignity is very important. To me, this is very, very interesting. Um, because there are about 40 to uh, 40 to 45 of you that uh, 40 of you that have voted, and we are finding that um, many of you don't consider ability to be important. And I would say that may be to me a little extreme, but I think what you are really saying is that opportunity and dignity are more important or as important as ability because we basically take for granted that ability is important, but in the absence of opportunity, in the absence of dignity, ability by itself doesn't do enough for social inclusion. Let's go to the next question. Thank you for voting. Uh, the next question is, people are excluded from markets, services, and spaces. Which one do you think is the most difficult to influence? A, markets, B, services, or C, spaces? All right, uh, uh, you know, this is fantastic. Um, you think that of those least easy to be influenced, 28% of you said markets, only 3.5% of you say services, and almost 69% of you say services, and I could not agree more. You're absolutely right. First of all, um, the way we think about spaces um, is, is very broad and it's really about power and about politics and about many of the things you're absolutely right are very difficult to influence um, and services you're right people are are used to influencing health and education and transport so people know what to do um, as far as markets are concerned you're also absolutely right it is actually quite difficult to influence uh, things like land markets because perhaps of um, a lot of the politics that may be involved in making um, changes to, to land relations. So, um, yes, uh, I would agree with that. Can we go to the next one? Great. Thank you very much, Marjorie. The last question we have is, which one of the groups below should get more attention than they currently do? A, people with disabilities. B, women. C, indigenous peoples and ethnic minorities. D, sexual minorities, or E, migrants. <laughs> 
All right. Okay. Um, so of the answers, um, almost half of you, forty-two uh, percent, say people with disabilities. Um, only three point eight percent of you say women, and you're right. Women are not a very heterogeneous category. So there are you know rich women, poor women, privileged women, underprivileged women, um, indigenous persons, and uh, people, and and ethnic minorities. Uh, more than a quarter of you, almost twenty-seven percent of you, say they need more attention. Um, Eleven percent of you say sexual minorities need more percent, um, no, more more attention, and over fifteen percent of you say migrants need more attention. Um, this is actually quite interesting to me uh, that um, people with disabilities should be at the top of the of the of the um, curve. My answer or my thought would be that it would depend a lot on the context, and I guess it would depend a lot on. Um, the the way these these uh, groups are being currently treated and the kinds of uh, the kind of attention that is currently being given. Um, so yes, somebody said there is no right or wrong answer to this one. Um, you're absolutely right. Thank you very much, Matri. And now we will open up uh, to answering your questions. So please ask your questions. Um, as soon as you, you have one. Um, one of the questions that we have from Edward De Jesus is, where is youth on that list in terms of an excluded group? Yes, um, that's that's actually a, a very interesting question. And that is is exactly the kind of, kind of conversation that's going on, is that there is really no right or wrong answer. Um, the, the youth are a very large, or probably less large, but a very large and a very heterogeneous category of people. Um, in, some, in some cases, uh, people who are, you, uh, are young are discriminated or are not given enough attention. But I think in our, um, in our list of identities, we did include gender and age. Now, age could be young people. It could be older people. Um, depending on the context, it could be um, a different kinds of people that don't get enough attention. So, in many countries, people are are really focusing on um, you know the youth, uh, giving spaces to youth, giving employment opportunities and skills to youth. In other places, people are just ignoring them. Thank you, Maitri. Uh, another question we have from Ruby Devi uh, uh, talks about India. Uh, he notes that Indians, India's northeastern states have been marred with ethnic violence, power struggles. Can social inclusion policies help reduce ethnic violence and separatist movements in the region and make communities feel like they're part of democratic India? Um, all right. Um, thank you very much, um, Ruby. Uh, that's actually a, a, a very, very important uh, question and I think certainly social inclusion policies can affect in in reducing all kinds of of, uh, of violence um, in my uh, in my personal view um, violence actually erupts after um, there has been there have been feelings of exclusion over a period of time and policy not being um, probably not being able to reach uh, groups that have had feelings of, of ex exclusion. Um, but I certainly think my feeling, again, is that there has been progress in that in this regard, especially over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Um, but there is, you're absolutely right, there is violence and there is, there is discrimination against um, uh, persons from Northeastern states, especially when they move into um, into other parts of, of India, and that is something that is, is it's one of the most one of the most disturbing trends that I'm seeing in in India. Great, thanks, Matri. Um, we have another question from Jose Cuesta on the differences between poverty reduction and social inclusion. Is the role that freedom can play? We have several examples of society that have reduced monetary poverty under autocracy. Do you know examples of social inclusion in authoritarian regimes? Uh, you know the idea of an authoritarian regime, um, uh, Jose, is uh, is a contested one, as you know very well. So there are regimes that may be considered authoritarian in one way, but in fact have done um, very well in terms of reduction of poverty in uh, in other uh, you know in, in among ethnic minorities. Um, of course, Amartya Sen's 
um, thesis really is that freedom and democracy go hand in hand with social inclusion and um, in, in terms of uh, poverty reduction. Um, and that's certainly very true. Um, but I think that um, authoritarianism is, 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 to me, that's the important thing. How are you defining or how are we thinking about authoritarianism? Because um, I know of several cases where regimes that may be considered authoritarian or where there are, let's say, regimes where there are a lot more controls on freedom actually have done quite well in um, in reducing poverty. And the opposite is true uh, and of social inclusion. And the opposite is true in very democratic societies. OK, um, so then there is a question actually on how we measure exclusion. Um, so uh, this is something I would like to make a pitch for our next seminar. It's on September. Uh, it's on January the seventh, and we're going to focus entirely on measuring exclusion. Um, so there are a couple of other questions. In uh, are we seeing anything more? That uh, there are a lot of comments, and I'm I'm very I'm very glad for this this conversation. Um, there's one from Santiago Silava. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. Um, all kinds of social exclusion are difficult to eradicate, but one based on faith is one of the most difficult one. Nevertheless, um, it seems that the bank doesn't take that into account. Uh, what do you think are the ways to, uh, to foster social inclusion in mono-religious societies? Interesting. Mono-religious societies is not uh, something that I'm... Um, I'm, I'm fairly... There, my sense is that most societies tend to have a, a certain diversity of, of um, religion. So they do tend to have a greater diversity than mono-religious. If you mean theocratic, um, that's a different issue. But um, I think that you're right. Uh, the bank has paid less attention. I would not say that it has not taken it into account. There are um, many, many um, cases where the bank actually has focused on religion as being an axis of exclusion. Very often, religion and ethnicity tend to converge, and certain ethnicities also f uh, follow religions which may be considered minority religions. So it may not, it's the intersection of religion with something else that tends to confer the real disadvantage. Um, but I'm, I'm a bit intrigued by your idea of mono-religious uh, societies, again, um, in which case everyone is of the same religion and it's likely that they're all included, but uh, I could be getting you wrong. Um, there's a, there's a, an, a question from Gaia uh, with the idea of measurable impacts guiding development practice. Would you see there are measures? Again, the answer, Gaia, is that on January 7th, a colleague of mine will actually be speaking from the report on measuring social inclusion. So I would hate to preempt that. Uh, Asim Kumar asks, um, how do you solve religious divide, uh, especially one that is rooted in historical clashes? Case in point, Hindu ethnic Kashmiris and Muslim Kashmiris. You know, uh, Asim, this is an extremely um, a fractious uh, question. I don't think that um, you know a two-minute answer is going to do justice to that question. Um, it is also it's also very very complex. So I'm going to hold off on that just because it's too important and uh, too difficult to actually do justice in two minutes. Um, greetings indeed from uh, from Washington to Armenia. Uh, so uh, Santiago says I meant um, countries where only one belief is legal. I see. Um, and yes, so you know, then we are actually getting into the questions. Many of the questions that you are asking are indeed questions that we um, we address in um, in one of our chapters in in this report, which actually says social inclusion is about power. It is about changing relations of power, and it is about um, legal reform and other kinds of reform. So um, it's a uh, um, you know. The question was, when one belief is legal, we are talking again about, about democracy. We are talking again about uh, freedoms that Jose mentioned. Um, and so um, it, it's difficult. Nobody says social inclusion is uh, an easy process. 
but that there are incremental steps that can be taken towards social inclusion. It's not a one, one stroke of the pen reform and often needs a lot of social movements over a period of time to actually make the changes towards social inclusion. So uh, Edward um, de Jesus asks, do you think um, individual advocates can help promote inclusion of certain groups? We're working with uh, advocates to, to promote youth inclusion in the labor market. I think absolutely. I think individual advocates can play a very big role. Uh, but even bigger role, I feel, advocates can play when individuals actually come together to network and to form very strong lobbies to influence policy. So certainly, I think it's a really, really important, um, you know, a very important way to advance social inclusion. And much, many of the answers to the questions that you have asked actually are um, based on the extent to which there is a groundswell of pressure from below to, to demand social in, um, inclusion. Mark Cole asks, how do we solve social exclusion, uh, which is being um, bred for, for political power? Again, I just, I, I just mentioned um, that these are highly political questions, that social inclusion is a highly political process. It is about the more you include people who have been historically disadvantaged, then the more you, I don't like the word very much, empower them. Um, it, the more likely it is that you are disturbing some kind of a status quo. Um, and it's, it's likely that social exclusion and many forms of institutionalized social exclusion are in fact for the purposes of keeping power of certain groups um, intact. And so um, it's, it's, I think the idea of solving social exclusion is, a, is a, to me a, a difficult idea because I don't think that the issue is ever resolved. Because when you include certain groups, you may actually be excluding some others. So what we see is that social inclusion is a process that is, um, that's an ongoing process. And there's, it's, the work of social inclusion is actually never done because there will be transitions that will, that will necessitate that more policies are put in place and there may be ways in which uh, you are actually taking away power or giving power that will then lead to different social equi equilibriums. Um, again, um, uh, Sherry and Gray, are there measurements or tools designed to me measure empowerment? Actually. Um, there are actually measures that are greater measures for empowerment than there are for social ex um, inclusion. Um, there is a book. It's called Measuring Empowerment. I don't have it, um, the, it right on me right, uh, right now. It is edited uh, by Naila Kabir. And uh, if you just Google Naila Kabir plus Measuring Empowerment, you will come up with a lot of, um, lot of measures. Ruby Devi, absolutely, you're right. Social inclusion process has to be bottom up as well as top down. And as at some level, the two have to come together. Um, so certainly there are, um, there are it's, it's, a, it's a complex process, but the complexity should not deter us from moving forward towards social inclusion. So Camilla um, has put questions that have come earlier. Uh, what are the key aspects of building resilience with inclusion and what are the main challenges? Um, if you mean resilience in terms of resilience after a disaster or after a crisis, um, I think in some very strange way, my feeling is that crises and disasters actually offer us with opportunities to um, build new societies and uh, to, to build, say, as you're building new neighborhoods and new houses after a disaster, you could potentially be building neighborhoods and houses that have people with, with diverse ethnic groups living together. They could be people of different socioeconomic backgrounds that tend to live together in the new neighborhoods. So to my mind, their re resilience actually gives us an opportunity for social inclusion because it has raised to the ground, both literally and figuratively, um, old forms of, of exclusion. And what are the main challenges? My sense is that the main challenges may be technical, for sure, um, but depending on the context. Um, but I think the challenges would also be political. So there would need to be some kind of social contract that allows us to build new societies um, after, uh, after a disaster or after a crisis. 
Um, could you share with us examples on the ground where inclusion has worked and yield results at scale? Um, again, I don't want to preempt our third seminar, which is going from from Sabine. I'm sorry, it's from uh, from, from Sabine Palmrotter. Um, and I would not like to preempt our third seminar, which is going to be on uh, on examples. But let let me give you one one example. Okay, well, uh, the example is from Bangladesh. Um, Bangladesh has um, a whole plethora of informal justice systems because uh, very few people actually go to the formal justice system. The informal justice system in Bangladesh is called the Shalish. And um, the Shalish tends to be village-based and it used to be a very, very exclusionary forum where women could not participate in Shalishes and the, the judgments that were not really judgments, but basically whatever the Shalish decided uh, would tend to be actually keeping the status quo and almost always go against um, the interests of women in the community because they would almost always be related to some form of family law. Um, over time, um, NGOs and other social activists came together to build alternative Shalishes. So they, they came together to have a shalish that was parallel to the old shalish, almost like a new shalish, which had actually women on the, on the shalish. So the, 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 the people who sit on the shalish are called shalishkars. And um, the, there were actually women on the shalish. And now we're actually finding that shalishes are giving judgments which are much more inclusionary to the extent that the government of Bangladesh is trying to replicate that at the level of the Union Parishad, which is the lowest tier of the local government. So it's an example of uh, an initiative of social inclusion that has actually gone to scale, but there are multiple such examples. So how do we incorporate the, uh, from, from the Jana Chatterjee, there's a, there's a question, how do we incorporate the concept of social inclusion in the planning of cities for developing countries? Um, and, you know, again, this is, this is, in, in two minutes, it's very difficult to ju do justice to um, a question like that. Um, but I think one of the ways in which we can think about that is in terms of residence patterns. Where are we constructing houses? Are we constructing gated communities where only very rich people um, live and uh, people who belonged to um, the traditionally excluded group don't even have access? Or are we building um, multi-ethnic, multi um you know, multi socioeconomic buildings where people of different groups actually reside. So that's one idea of social inclusion in cities. Another idea is transport facilities. Where are your where are your metro rails going? What is the route for your uh, for your met metro rails? Um, what are ways in which uh, min municipal transport, for instance, who is it catering to? Is it safe enough? Does it actually cater to um, the needs of, of women and young people who may be going to schools or going to work, whose timings are quite different from the timings that men go to so-called offices? Uh, so there are many ways in which you, we can incorporate the idea of social inclusion in the planning of cities. Um, and and there's the, we actually have some work that's ongoing on inclusive cities. And we will be uh, we'll be talking about that in one of our on one of our seminars as well. Patricia Costa asks, what role does self segregation play in inclusionary planning policies? Um, I think I addressed this about self exclusion and self segregation, um, and and I I don't actually agree that people deliberately self exclude or self segregate unless they have a rational reason for doing so. Alok Tiwari asks, how do, do we integrate social inclusion in climate change resilience? Um, um, is it worth, worth it? Yes, of course it's worth it. And um, there, is, uh, there is, again, a whole literature out there. I talked very briefly about resilience in, in my, the first question um, in answer to uh, Miriam Merchant. Um, there is Sedu Traore, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, in poor countries, what is the best approach or practice to identify the target poor and vulnerable groups and cover ac accurately their specific needs in water and sanitation se service delivery? Targeting is uh, both an art and a science. Um, there is a lot of literature. If you go to our social protection uh, website, the World Bank Social Protection website, you will find a lot of resources on targeting. Um, 
um, and um, in terms of how do you target specifically for water and sanitation, um, there are multiple ways in which you target. There are ways where you actually map water and sanitation facilities. There are ways in which you actually map the supply of water and sanitation. But then you also map who, um, despite the supply of services, may not have access to water and sanitation. So there are different ways of targeting, and merely poverty targeting may not work. Ruby Devi, final question. Um, how do NGOs and advocacy groups help understand demand for social inclusion uh, policies, especially among uh, minority women? I have exactly two minutes. Um, so NGOs and advocacy groups actually have a very large role. And I uh, talked briefly about an earlier question that had come about individual activists. And I still maintain that it's not individuals, but actually lobbies and networks coming together to advance social inclusion that actually have much more of an impact than, than uh, merely small, small efforts. Uh, do I have one more, one more question? OK, Mark Cole, this is the final question. Does there have to be a certain level of educational exposure among socially excluded for social inclusion to really work? I have a feeling social inclusion is passed down through generations. Um, social exclusion is indeed pass, passed down to generation, but that's not because not only because people don't have the educational exposure. Um, I think that even people who are not educated actually have a very good understanding of the ways in which they are excluded and have a very good understanding about ways in which they can be included and the kinds of policies that can be put in place. So yes, education is extremely important. We need to move forward. And it, it, without education, nothing can really happen towards social inclusion. But it is a necessary, though not a sufficient condition. Um, Joe, over Great. to you. Thank you very much, Manchuri. I think the presentation and the question and answer stimulated a lot of discussion, a lot of great questions from the audience, and uh, a lot of very thoughtful and, uh, and informed responses. So thank you very much to everyone who's participating. Um, as a reminder, we will delve deeper um, next month uh, and explore different dimensions of uh, social inclusion. So on January 7th, um, we will have a session on measuring social inclusion and how to do so. And then in February, we will have policies and programs, which will our experts will delve into what needs to be done, what can be done to, uh, to make a, a difference. And I'm sure all of you still may have some questions or comments for Maitri. So you can connect with her on Twitter at Das Maitri. Uh, that's her Twitter handle, D-A-S-M-A-I-T-R. E Y I. And uh, thank you very much. Hope thank you. Have a wonderful you. Day. Thank you very, very much for connecting. Look forward to meeting you again.